Hey there, and welcome back to Journey to the Sunny Side. I'm Mike Hardenbrook, and today we're diving into a topic that hits home for so many mindful drinkers, understanding a more personalized plan for our own habits. I'm super excited to be joined with Rachel Hart, coach, author, and host of Take a Break podcast. Rachel's all about helping people change their relationship with alcohol without relying on willpower or feeling deprived. She's developed a framework for understanding different drink archetypes, and we're gonna unpack all that today. Rachel has guided thousands of people towards rethinking their habits and making lasting change. And if you're looking for a game-changing approach to your mindful drinking journey, this is it. So let's jump in with Rachel Hart. Rachel, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Well, you're all about helping people change their relationship with alcohol, but there's always an origin story to this. So can you share a little bit about your story with alcohol and how everything came about? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I started drinking when I went to college. I was 17 and I definitely was like, oh, like this is amazing. Like this is how I go to a party and I don't feel, you know, insecure and I'm just confident and outgoing. Um, And so I definitely from the outset, really, I really enjoyed drinking. I also started to have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with it. Um, But, you know, for me, it was college. It was a kind of thing where it's like, okay, it's fine. You know, you're young. You can be kind of like messy and sloppy sometimes. It's not a big deal. And, you know, after college, I moved to New York and I started... I, I started kind of worrying more. I started kind of feeling like, huh, okay, maybe the behaviors in college that were funny and fun are maybe not so great as you're trying to, you know, become a professional and become like a real adult and live in the city. And so I, I knew that I wanted to change my drinking and I felt very stuck on how to go about doing that. I really didn't feel like at that time there was, you know, I'm in my 40s now. I didn't feel like there was a lot of guidance out there other than kind of like, well, if you have a problem, you should go to AA, which didn't seem like the right fit for me. And so, you know, I really was in a place for so long of just just kind of like groping, like feeling like, you know, I was in the dark, um, kind of feeling like I was in no man's land, like nobody could relate. And I also I really didn't want like talking about it with people. I had a lot of shame around it. And I, and I also just felt confused because I didn't always go overboard. I didn't always overdo it. Like there was a component to my drinking that just like didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense why sometimes I would go out with friends and, you know, we'd have a couple drinks and I'd call it a night. And sometimes I'd go out and it'd be like 2 a.m. and I'd be at the kebab truck, you know, like I just I couldn't really make sense of it. And so, you know, I had this kind of long personal journey to figuring out my own relationship with alcohol and what was going on and understanding, you know, that it was really more than just I like to drink. Um, It was more than what I thought for a long time is, oh, maybe I have an addictive personality. And and then, you know, kind of took that and decided, you know, I actually want to help people with this because at, you know, at that time, there just didn't feel like there was a lot out there um, beyond the kind of traditional 12 step approaches. Yeah, I think that you echo the inner dialogue of so many people that are listening here. I know that from my own experience, I kind of went from college, like you said, you know, I'm just going out and doing things. I remember saying to myself, like, this is the only time that's socially acceptable to just overindulge and be a little wild. And then as I got into more professional settings and wanted to do better and, but still not lose a part of that identity Mm -hmm. too. Did you feel like you sort of in that transition, that identity had to shift? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, in a way, I feel like the my own journey, I, I feel like I actually, as I've done this work and changed my relationship with alcohol, have become more of who I am, more of myself, because I no longer see it as like, well, this is my only chance to overindulge, or this is my This is the only way that I can feel, you know, not feel awkward in social situations. I, you know, doing this work, it wasn't really just about, okay, how do I learn how to work with my cravings and my urges and have more self-control? It was really about how do I have these, the tools and the resources that I need so I don't feel like I'm always missing out or I don't feel like, well, there's no, you know, I remember thinking a lot like if I'm not going to drink, there is no point in going. 
right? Like, why would I even bother? Yeah. So, so I really do feel like, you know, along the way, I, I, you know, I kind of returned more to a version of myself when I was younger, right? That like, just felt more free and more kind of like, um, able to be who I was and not care what people thought and be silly and spontaneous. And, you know, I, I feel like it almost kind of brought me full circle in a way. Yeah, that's awesome. And we're going to talk about your archetypes and sort of the philosophy that you have. But before we do, you know, you shared a little bit of your story. Can you share about what your drinking sort of was at the point that you really weren't unhappy and what it looks like today and what sort of like your philosophy is with the people that you work with? Yeah. Um, well, so the first thing I'll just say that my philosophy for the people that I work with is really to let them decide what feels like a good sustainable relationship for them. So it's not like I'm really not about, you know, what is You know, actually, you'd be better off and so much healthier and so much more virtuous if you just never drank again. Right. Or telling people like this, you know, these are the guidelines. This is the quantity or the amount. Right. That, that you know, the CDC says is the right amount. I really think it needs to be an individual journey that also can change and shift over time. And that is my story for sure. You know, a lot of people that I work with, you know, they sometimes want to start out with experimenting with alcohol free periods. And that was something for me that was an important part for me. Like I, you know, I knew that I wanted to just have like a period away from alcohol for a bit, but I wasn't saying I'm never going to drink again. And in fact, because that's so much of the traditional approach is like, listen, if you have a problem, you can never drink again. I think that kept me from examining my drinking for a long time because it felt like, well, if I can't figure this out, I'm going to be like 80 years old, right? And like not allowed to drink. A hundred percent. I'm right there with you. It yeah. prolonged it yeah. so much. Um, so now, you know, I always talk about people wanting to like, you know, maybe you want to drink less, you want to drink rarely, you want to experiment with alcohol free periods, maybe you want to stop, maybe you decide you want to take it out. Like, I think there's a lot of space, not only for people to figure out what's right for them, but to move in and out of those places. I am in the place now of rarely drinking. Um, it's something that occasionally I partake in, but it's not, it's just not a... It's not something that I often want to kind of gravitate towards. A lot of that has to do with work that I've done around mindful drinking and really understanding, like, how do I stay present and how do I um, how do I actually differentiate between, like, am I really liking this or, you know, am I just kind of in this place of, like, wanting more and more is better? But, you know, the more that I have done that work there around mindful drinking, the, the, the more I've realized, like, I actually don't, when I drink, I don't want that much, um, yeah. which, by the way, is mind blowing for me because I, I was like, I am missing an off switch in my brain. More is always better. I was always the one, right, the fastest one to finish their drink. I was just um, I was just with some friends from college. We were taking like a little girls vacation together. And I remember just being like, oh, I'm the slowest one. Like, I'm the slowest one having a drink here, which, like, the idea that I could make that transformation seemed impossible when I was in a place of, like, I don't know, this is just who I am. I always want more. You know, I'm missing this off switch. I, you know, I don't have an ability to rein myself in. Yeah, I feel like that, and I drink everything fast. And, I mean, if somebody were to ask, what, well, how come you don't mix, drink mixed drinks? I'm like, so I drink everything fast. Yep. It doesn't matter if it's coffee, but definitely that. And I knew at least, uh, I was at least mindful enough to know that at the time. <laughs> so, and I love what you say. So set your own goals. Nothing is permanent. We're always growing. We're always changing and evolving. I mean, I can relate to what you said. I went from nightly drinker to long stints of not drinking to moderation. And now I just seldom drink all mm -hmm. that much. Um, and, and I'll go long periods at without bit planning it, without saying never or whatever. Um, so I love the fact that you can just choose your own goal. Uh, it's not do as I say, whatever feels like too much or the right amount, you get to choose that. So yeah, you I, I choose, love this conversation. You get to choose and you get to change your mind. And I think that that's a really hard thing for um, a lot of people to wrap their brains around because it really is the opposite message that we get, right? It's kind of like either you drink or you don't. Right. And if you make a decision to say no, you're making a decision forever. Right. So we don't allow for this kind of fluidity. We don't allow for that. And and 
you know, for, I think most people find it incredibly freeing when they realize like, oh, wait, this is up to me and I get to decide and I can experiment and I can change my mind. And that's OK. It doesn't mean that I failed or I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. Or also I'll toss in you're either quote unquote normal or yeah. you're problematic. Yeah, so. exactly. Right. Like we have we, this very black and white. Um, we have this very black and white way of talking about people who struggle with saying no and it you know it falls just into these black and white categories instead of really understanding like it's a spectrum and also it can change it can change you know when things change in your life it can change with different circumstances with age right and like it doesn't have to just be like oh nope sorry you like you got to wear this label it's right kind of like you've got to wear the label you're the you're the you know problematic drinker i i we i to just observe and and understand like there's more gray in this there's more gray in this spectrum a hundred percent i'm right there with you so let's jump into it because i don't want anybody to be on their edge of the seat too long so you've made up this thing or you created this thing called the drink archetypes and why don't you start like what what inspired you to start and create this framework yeah, I mean, part of it was working with so many different people. Um, and so really just observing all the different ways that humans have learned to use alcohol. Part of it was also wanting to help explain, like, well, why is it? Like, why do a lot of people have the experience that their drinking looks different in different situations, right? That it's not always across the board, you know, 100% of the time looks exactly the same. And I, you know, the more that I worked with people, the more I started to kind of see these patterns. And I was, for a long time, I, I kind of knew that the patterns existed and it was very much a part of how I worked with people, but I didn't have a way um, at that point to really kind of help people identify themselves and help people use these archetypes, right? It was kind of something that I could see what I was working with people, but, you know, wasn't able, they couldn't see it necessarily. And so, you know, coming up with the archetypes was really, I mean, it was really after almost a decade of working with people and so many people and seeing so many different patterns and figuring out, like, I, I want to help people be able to understand their drinking in different situations. So the archetypes, it's not even like, oh, you're this type right? Pete, you can have multiple archetypes. They can change in different situations. They can change over time. It's really helping you understand, you know, how are you using the drink, right? What is your brain seeing beyond just, well, that's my favorite drink or I like how it tastes, right? What is the kind of unconscious patterns going on there? Because if you understand what they are, it helps really with figuring out how do I intervene, Right. Why does it feel difficult to say no? Why am I drinking more in some situations or around some people than with others? Got it. So why don't we get into and you can help me with this question, breaking down the different archetypes and why they're significant and maybe some of the telltale signs that we should look for or somebody can identify with and why it's important. And I know I threw in a lot of double bear questions there for you. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying you help me walk through this. Uh, sure. answering this question. So um, there are eight different archetypes. Um, and again, uh, these can change, right? You may see yourself in multiple ones. It's very, very normal. So the first one is the upgrade archetype. It's about using a drink to kind of elevate a situation or or make make an event feel special. There's also the connector archetype, which is all about kind of um, either creating or maintaining bonds and feeling close with people. There's the reward. The reward archetype is something that uh, I work with a lot of people on. It's kind of like I had a long day, rough hate. I just want to kind of treat myself because I've been working hard and I'm dealing with everything at work and I'm dealing with my kids. And right. It, it's that sense of using it as a as a um, reward for yourself. There's also the escape. So the escape is a little bit more around like I don't want to feel these feelings. Right. It's it's trying to avoid certain emotions, often kind of these kind of big, bigger, kind of hairier emotions that were, that were like, oh, I don't want to feel that. There is also the mask. So the mask archetype, this is one that came up for me quite a bit in college, which is like, I don't want to feel awkward in social situations, right? I just want to feel at mm -hmm. ease. I just want to feel confident. So, you know, your brain sees the drink as a way to deal with anxiety that you might have in social situations. 
There's also the hourglass. The hourglass is kind of an interesting one because it can um, appear when someone has a lot of time on their own, right? So a lot of kind of downtime. And it's just like, I don't know, drinking is better than, you know, doing mm -hmm. this or it yeah. makes like my evenings more entertaining. It can also appear when you might be in situations where you're not enjoying who you're with, right? You don't, you're kind of like, oh, I don't really like what I'm doing. I don't like who I'm hanging out with, but, you know, I can make this more enjoyable if I drink. And then there's the release and the remedy. So the release is also another one that, especially for me in my 20s, that I really connected to this one. I was so fixated on like trying to be perfect and do everything right and, you know, be like the best at my job and all, you know, just like always focused on um, everybody else. And the release was like, oh, this is my time when I can just stop caring, right? I don't have to care what, you know, I'm saying or doing or um, how I'm feeling. Like it was just kind of like throwing everything off. And then finally, the remedy is all about the times where people might use a drink to deal with insomnia or if injury or dealing with chronic pain. And, and so again, it, it's really about using the archetypes to figure out, okay, so what is my desire about in this situation? Yes, perhaps your brain has learned it's five o'clock and you, you know, this is what we do at five o'clock. We pour a drink. Yes, there's that piece of it. But I, I'm always, I'm always kind of trying to help people to look a little bit beyond that and, and kind of understand, you know, is there something else going on here? Right. What does the drink represent? Because a lot of times when people want to say no or they, you know, they're trying to either say no or they're trying to moderate, what will happen is that the archetype will kind of bubble up. Right. It will kind of be like, well, things don't feel special or I, you know, this is what we do when we watch the game. And now I don't feel like, you know, I'm hanging like I don't feel I feel like I'm on the outside looking in. Right. And so what will kind of bubble up um, in your attempts to say no or to moderate is often very, very connected to the archetype that's been activated. No, I love that. And thanks for the breakdown. I actually thought of something fun as you were going through this. What do you think about maybe breaking down or identifying some archetypes to my previous drinking behaviors? And maybe you could tell me where it lines up. So I first one, I could say the mask a little bit okay. because even though I'm social and I like to go out, I would feel definitely in college for sure. When we go to a bar and the guys would all split off and you kind of have to go and mingle and meet people, I would definitely use it like that. Yeah. So the mask like that. But as I got older, uh, you know, I was starting multiple companies. I was an entrepreneur. So I was like burning the candle on both ends. And the only way I could say it's quitting time and stop working and stop letting my thoughts go and just sit down and maybe like, watch some TV was to open that bottle of wine. Yeah. Which one would that like? Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. Like it, it could be a mix of the reward or the escape. So a lot of times with the reward, it's like, okay, day is done, right? Like my day is over because I, I got myself a beer. I poured myself a glass of wine. So it's kind of setting a boundary. That's what often happens with the reward archetype. It's like alcohol becomes this boundary that you don't even realize. It's like, no, I don't have to think about work, right? Or sometimes people will be like, OK, well, I have to keep working, <laughs> right? Like I have more emails to get back to, but like at least I have a treat. Like at least I get to like respond to these emails at nine o'clock, right? And I have a drink by my side. Sometimes if it's like that desire to really shut off your brain, like I just want to stop thinking about work, right? And I like can't, right? I, I, I try to sit down and, you know, turn on Netflix and I'm still thinking about these things. And maybe it's work, maybe it's family, right? Sometimes that can be a little bit of the escape, right? And so it's like you're you're kind of going through the day maybe with all this pent up overwhelm or all this pent up anxiety, right? And it, it's not it it it's like when you stop working, all of a sudden it's like oh, now it's just there. So it, you know it depends, but um, I, I think that that what you describe is so very common, especially for mm -hmm. people who are like managing so much, right? They've got so much going on. Um, and it's just like, hey, this is how I stop working and stop thinking about how everything that has been on my mind during the day. What about, th that's really awesome and uh, it's helpful because you kind of break it down in, you know, what you're actually doing at a deeper level than just saying, oh, this is what I do. But what about people that like, let's say you have a stressful day or you have an argument with a spouse the or girlfriend and you're like, you know, F it, I'm just going to go 
get myself a drink. Yeah. Where, where does that fall? Um, again, you know, it, I, one of the things that I really think, and it really helps for people to kind of familiarize, familiarize themselves with the archetypes and kind of see, because there can be overlap, but sometimes that kind of like effort can tend to be the release, right? It can tend to be just like, I don't want to, I don't want to think about any of this, right? I'm just kind of, and the release often, um, what often shows up is drinking a lot, drinking really quickly, like that sense of like, when you, when that archetype is activated, you are not so into mindful drinking because you're like, no, the whole point is I don't want to be here, right? Like, I remember I, that. I used to say, I don't want one beer. I want four to six beers yes. at least. Right. And so, no, but then like, it's this really interesting thing of like, huh, why do I want four to six? Right. Um, What's going, like, what is it that if I have like one or two, I'm like, this is not doing the trick. And of course, we can have conversations about tolerance, right, and how tolerance can increase. But a lot of times what people will find, especially with the release and the escape archetypes, is they're like, uh, yeah, one drink's not going to cut it for what I'm seeking right now. And again, like it can be the escape. Sometimes, you know, you're you're angry at your spouse and it's like or your partner and you're just like, I just don't want to be present with it. Sometimes it can also show up uh, a, a little bit with the release of that idea of using a drink to rebel. Right. So sometimes having a drink is a little bit like giving a middle finger to someone. <laughs> uh, so but it, it just really depends. Right. And it's not so much about like. OK, like this is the, you know, like this is the specific archetype in it. <laughs> it's more yeah. like using them as a way to understand what is going on here beyond just this desire to drink. Right. Like what what else is kind of underneath the surface? Because when you understand that, it really helps you if you want to change. It helps you figure out how am I going to intervene differently in those situations? Because intervening, you know, when you're dealing with feeling awkward, right, socially, um, with your desire is very different than intervening when you're having that kind of like effort moment, right? Like for me, I was just like, I'm just, I knew those nights in retrospect where I was just like, oh no, with two drinks is not going to do it, right? Like I just, I want to have all the drinks. So how you kind of intervene and work with yourself in those different situations is going to change. Yeah, I like the way you break it down because it's not like it's an archetype where it's, that's me. Mm -hmm. It's more like, yeah, I do that and I, I do that. You know, if you read like a horoscope, you might hear it and then like, yeah, okay, that's me. Yeah, yeah. that's me. Like, but um, so you go through these and I think it brings awareness to what your actual behaviors are and the deeper level of like where it starts and what your actions end up uh, doing because of that. What's like the next step? Once you familiarize yourself and you're understanding these, where do you take it next from there? Yeah. Well, one of the things, I, well, one thing I do want to add, I think it's really important that the archetypes are not, they're not reflective of problematic drinking, right? So they're not a sign of like, oh, like you're, it's one of the archetypes, like I'm doing something bad. This is a problem. They're reflective of how like humans, how our species has learned to use alcohol, right? And so you can see yourself in an archetype and also not be drinking that much, right? So I just think that's an important kind of piece, right? To see it as like, oh, this doesn't mean like it's a problem. It really is just like, oh, this is just like the different ways, right? That humans over thousands of years have been like, oh, this is what we can use a drink for. Um, can I just throw something in there? Because yeah. I've taken one of those random tests that you Google for around AUD and all of hey. that. And, you know, I'm looking at it even in retrospect and I'm like, 90% of the people that I know, unless they're the type that have like one or two drinks a year, probably could answer multi multiple okay. of these questions. And it came out as problematic when I took it. My wife, who has zero problem with alcohol, um, took it. And it also told her. So it's like, you know, even these other things that you look at, you, I think you got to realize that it's not, it's a, it's a behavior, but it's not necessarily an indication. Yeah, it's not necessarily an indication, right? Like it really is just meant to be like, Let's just understand that there's something going on here beyond just I like the way it tastes or I like the way it makes me feel. Right. And, and yeah. I think the other thing with, you know, we just we just love to pathologize things. We love to kind of like throw around labels. And I and to me, that's like part of the problem and limits the conversation because we're so often either like 
demonizing alcohol or pathologizing, right? It's like, oh, your brain is different. There's something wrong with your brain or moralizing, right? And that, that can go either way. It's like, oh, it's so virtuous not to drink. Like I often talk with people how that, and by the way, I fell into that too during periods of not drinking, but feeling very virtuous can sometimes backfire, right? Because you're sitting there feeling like, oh, I'm being so healthy. Look at me. I'm going to wake up and feel great tomorrow. But I wasn't acknowledging there were, you know, because I at that point wasn't dealing with the archetypes that were underneath that I was like feeling like I was missing out. Right. So I was like really relying on fe- like using it as a way to feel good about myself that I was saying no. But guess what happens then the next time, right? Either you you wake up and you're like, oh, I had too much to drink. Right. It becomes like, oh, so, you know, I was bad. Right. So we get into this place of moralizing you know, and making it this this thing about who we are as a person rather than just recognizing like alcohol has been with humans for thousands of years. Right. Like we don't need to we don't need to demonize or moralize or pathologize in order to actually help people have healthier relationships with it. Now, I love that. And to sort of summarize this, you're saying that we can identify sort of these certain types of behaviors and we can change them in the hope that by changing them in this way, we're not going to feel deprived or that we're missing out. Yeah, because, because listen, if you feel deprived, them. if you feel like you're missing out, it's very hard, right, like to stick with whatever you're doing. It's kind of like a diet, right? People are like, OK, I can follow a diet for a limited period of time. But if you're always like looking at what everybody else is eating, wishing you were eating that, right, most people invariably are going to give in. And I think what happens is a lot of people have the experience of, you know, either they set rules for themselves or they do a dry January, right? So they go into this, a little bit of this diet mentality and they're like, kind of, okay, I can do it. But then eventually they kind of return to old patterns and they make it mean, oh, see, something's wrong with me, right? I guess really like I'm the problem here. But the reason you return to old problems is because you're not actually dealing with the the big picture, right? You're not looking at the full picture of your drinking. It's just like, OK, I, I just have to follow this rule. Right. And, and so I always think like, you know, like counting drinks and dry Januaries and drink plans, like all of this can be amazing. But when people are in this place of like following it, but always feeling deprived, following it, always feeling like they're missing out, following it, feeling like they're sitting at the kids table, that's not a way to really create long term lasting change. I love that. I think that's a great place to leave off because deprivation or being deprived is very much linked with willpower, which is what we're going to talk about in the next episode. But before we do, and somebody wants to find out more about your drink archetypes, where th- where can they go? Um, so you can go to my site, rachelhart.com. You can take a quiz there and it will give you kind of a, a breakdown of your primary and secondary archetypes and the ones you kind of lean more most towards. Um, You can also just go to my site and read up on the archetypes and learn about them there. Oh, that's amazing. That wraps up today's episode of Journey to the Sunny Side. Huge thanks to Rachel Hart for breaking down these drink archetypes and showing us how they can impact our drinking habits. Don't miss out on the next episode where Rachel's back to talk about why relying on willpower isn't the key to changing your drinking habits and what actually works. Trust me, you won't want to miss this. If today's episode got you thinking about your own habits, head on over to sunnyside.co and take our three minute quiz to get personal insights into your drinking habits. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at sunnyside for daily tips, inspiration, and success stories. If you liked what you heard, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. And until next time, keep taking those small steps for a more mindful relationship with alcohol.